Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Mark Hughes. I'm the faculty director of the Kleinman Center and very happy to see an appropriately full room like this one for our uh, distinguished and beloved uh, speaker for today who's actually been with us for the entire week. One of the things that we do at the Kleinman Center is we have a very active and clearly robust visiting scholar program that brings people to Penn uh, for usually one week residencies. Uh, it's a little bit of a Tom Sawyer tricking his friends into whitewashing the fence. We invite nominations from uh, Penn faculty colleagues for people that they would like to be have on campus for a week and spend some time with. So it uh, generates a wonderful set of colleague experiences for both us and we like to thank for the visiting scholars as well. And Jesse's our current one, so he's got one more day after, after today on campus and we're very happy to have him. Um, Jesse Jenkins is probably, uh, you know, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to assert the claim that Jesse Jenkins may well have the highest Q score of any energy researcher in the world, certainly this month. He has been in, I think, just about every medium uh, and the top of each of those mediums, whether it be digital or print or broadcast or radio or television, of just about anybody uh, in the field. Uh, he's really everywhere right now um, because he has so much to say. Uh, the, many of the things, this is actually his third lecture this week, um, but I think in many ways this is the topic that is nearest and dearest to his heart. He's saved it for us and his travels around campus to deliver this talk. I like to think of Jesse, you know, there's a lot of conversation about uh, the transition to 100% clean or 100% renewable and so on in a number of energy systems in a number of ways. I like to think of uh, Jesse as, as leading us down the path of a transition to 100% reality. Uh, he is a very deep and thoughtful uh, thinker about the trade-offs, the choices, the technological boundaries and realities that we face as well as the, importantly, the political and organizational challenges that we have in any of these transitions. And he is such a refreshing, clear-eyed and clear-minded thinker and speaker. I know we're going to enjoy uh, the next hour or so. He's going to speak for 30 or 40 minutes, um, and then I'll moderate a uh, what I'm sure will be a very active and interesting question and answer back and forth. I've, I've got my uh, moderator's prerogative with a couple of questions I'm dying to ask Jesse, but I will yield to you uh, as you raise your hands. Um, if you don't, I'm going to jump right in myself. Uh, so Jesse is a PhD candidate in engineering systems at MIT's Institute for Data Systems and Society, and a very prominent and published, uh, very visible research, research colleague for the MIT Energy Initiatives Electric Power Systems Center and Group, and has done a number of um, been a co-author on a number of their more visible publications over the last year or two. Uh, he's got his master's in technology and policy at MIT in 2014, associated with a number of think tanks in Washington and elsewhere, including the Breakthrough Institute. Uh, again, has been, even before this last month or so, has been widely featured and referred to uh, from NPR to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Times Magazine. He's delivered invited testimony before several committees and has received fellowships from a number of places, including the National Science Foundation. It's a real pleasure to uh, ask Jesse to come up to the podium for his third and final formal talk at the University of Pennsylvania this week. Thank you. <clears throat> Son? We good? All right. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, yes, this is my product placement for the day. No. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Mark, for the incredibly flattering uh, introduction. Uh, and I also want to say thanks to the Kleiman Center, to everyone there for inviting me down for the week. It's been a really great opportunity to get to know the University of Pennsylvania and all of the folks across the university that are working on energy and climate-related issues from various departments. And I think it's testament to the Kleiman Center's efforts to really knit together that community across schools that I've been able to sit down and learn from and meet uh, people from the engineering department, from sociology, from uh, Wharton, um, from really across the campus that are all bringing various lenses to play um, on the critical challenges we face in the energy sector. And I think that's exactly the kind of uh, interdisciplinary, as we chatted about, or transdisciplinary uh, set of perspectives that um, need to be brought to bear to tackle the, the multifaceted challenges that we face in energy, uh, climate change, and the environment. 
So um, it's been great to be here. Sorry, I have to head home uh, after tomorrow. I wish I could stick around longer and, and keep the conversations going. Um, but I'm delighted today to spend a, a bit of time with you talking about my research on deep decarbonization of electric power systems, or our efforts to move towards a zero carbon uh, electricity supply mix. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinds of trade-offs and insights that um, uh, generated from, from my research along with uh, several very talented colleagues at, at MIT. So I'll skip over introducing myself since Mark did such a great job of doing that uh, for me. Um, so the challenge here is getting to zero. And by zero, I mean zero carbon emissions, or at least net emissions of CO2 from electricity generation and consumption. This uh, challenge in electricity sits within a broader backdrop of efforts to decarbonize the global economy uh, in order to confront the threats posed by climate change. So this graph from a great paper from uh, Glenn Peters et al. on Nature Climate Change recently on tracking our progress towards our Paris climate commitments looks at the decarbonization of our energy supply or the ratio between carbon emissions and energy production um, across the world and where we would have to be if we're uh, able to stay on track to hold global warming to less than two degrees Celsius on average depending on when we really kick in our concerted efforts to reduce emissions in 2010, 2020, or 2030 in the three different colored lines versus the baseline trajectory in gray, which is basically very little progress. So policy is key to drive this transition. And as you'll see, by the later half of the century, energy production of all types essentially has to be carbon free for us to uh, have a hope of limiting global warming and stabilizing the growth of uh, CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. So this is all energy, including uh, transportation, heating, uh, industrial energy inputs, et cetera. I focus in my work primarily on electricity because I think it's the linchpin in our efforts to decarbonize the overall economy. It's not the only thing we have to do, um, and, and it's not the only important challenge we face, but it's one of the central challenges, and it's central for two reasons. The first is that all of these scenarios for cutting emissions across the global economy depend on us cutting emissions furthest and fastest in electricity. And they count on that because we have a variety of low carbon substitutes that are available for electricity generation, whether that's wind or solar power, uh, hydropower or nuclear, um, uh, or potentially carbon capture and storage with fossil fuels. So since we have available substitutes, much more so than in other sectors like transportation or industry, uh, most strategies rely on the electric power sector leading the way towards zero emissions. So whereas the global economy might need to see our energy production reach zero emissions by 2070 or 2080, electric power must be carbon free by around mid-century, 2050. Um, and in the developed world, of course, we're expected to lead that transition um, as, and as opposed to developing economies. So really the, the, the race is on to zero emissions, particularly in places like the United States and Europe. At the same time, all of these strategies count on the electric power sector not only reducing emissions to zero, but expanding its share in the global economy to electrify other sectors and help decarbonize them. So whereas right now, electricity supplies about 20% of our final energy consumption, the rest coming from uh, oil and gas and, and other, uh, other fuels, uh, in many strategies for deep decarbonization of the overall economy, that share will expand to, to 30, 40, maybe 50% of our final economic activity um, and in this particular scenario from a Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, that leads to a doubling of electricity demand in the United States along the same time frame as we're trying to drive to zero. So this is the deep decarbonization challenge for electricity, simultaneously cutting emissions to zero and at the same time doubling our electricity production from clean sources to help decarbonize and electrify transportation, heating, industry, and other uh, industrial activities or economic activities. The unfortunate news is that we're falling behind. So in the same paper from Peters et al., they look at, um, at uh, the progress along decarbonization with several different types of technologies and fuels. So in this case, we see nuclear energy and carbon capture and storage, which are two of several of the options we have for decarbonizing electricity supply. And as you can see in black, our historical progress for both technologies is basically flat. We're not moving forward. And yet all of the strategies that they surveyed for how we would meet our CO2 reduction goals count on these technologies playing a greater role in our energy system. So you've probably seen recent headlines about the bankruptcy of Westinghouse, one of the largest producers of nuclear power plants, that was trying to build four new nuclear power stations in the United States. One of those uh, power plants um, in South Carolina, the VC Summer plant, has since been scrapped and canceled despite billions of dollars invested in that plant. The uh, second uh, pair of plants at Vogel in Georgia are moving forward, at least at this point, um, but are many billion dollars over, over budget and behind schedule. 
We've had similar challenges around carbon capture with the Kemper plant, uh, which was a, a coal gasification and uh, carbon capture demonstration project uh, built by a southern company in, in Mississippi, also being scrapped. Uh, it's now no longer going to gasify coal and capture its emissions. It's simply going to be a very expensive natural gas plant. Now, there are, more, uh, there are other demonstration projects that use other techniques for carbon capture that are making better progress. The Petronova project that NRG built in Texas, for example, uh, and a net power demonstration project going on right now. So there may be other routes, but they're really stuck at this demonstration phase, not in wide-scale commercial adoption. Where we are seeing progress, thankfully, is in renewable energy. So wind and solar power have fallen dramatically in cost and are now becoming cost competitive across much of the world. And in fact, we're seeing the growth, the, the sort of uh, uh, increasing, um, increasingly rapid growth of wind and solar energy track at least the early stages of the transition we would need uh, to keep on track with our two degrees Celsius goals. Now, so one thing you'll notice here is that that pace has to continue to accelerate to stay on track, and each of these trajectories depends on nuclear and carbon capture carrying their own weight, which we're falling behind on. So if we want to do it with wind and solar, we have to actually see much more rapid progress than we've seen, despite the rapid progress, uh, the, the, the progress we have made in recent years. So this has led to a lot of uh, excitement. The, the progress we've seen in the prices for solar and wind, for, for good reasons, has, has driven uh, excitable headlines across the world about how renewable energy is now becoming one of the cheapest ways we can produce power going forward, at least as new sources of energy. So there's been you know, shockingly cheap bids for power for new power plants submitted to Excel Energy in Colorado. The projections that by 2020, renewables will be the cheapest source of new energy across the entire world, or at least the bulk of it. Um, so we're seeing uh, really great progress, and that's been driven by uh, technological progress or reductions in the cost of these technologies. This is a 2015 study. We've seen further uh, reductions since 2015, but showing that just since 2008, uh, we've seen uh, a 94% decline in the cost of LED lighting, which has led to reductions in energy consumption, a 73% decline in the cost of uh, lithium-ion batteries, which might provide an important complement to wind and solar. And uh, utility scale solar, I think, is down by more like 85% through 2017, 64% through 2050. Wind power has come down by 30 or 40% as well and become more efficient uh, as we build larger uh, turbines. So this is where we're making progress, and it's exciting to see this. And what that's uh, led is to some people to start advocating that we really go all in on wind and solar, because we're seeing progress there. We're running into challenges with the other technologies. So why don't we commit our resources to the clear winners in this race and accelerate our adoption of wind and solar even further and try to decarbonize our energy system primarily with these renewable resources? Unfortunately, you see something different in the expert literature on deep decarbonization. So I reviewed with a colleague uh, um, 27 uh, papers uh, that all look, different studies that look at how to deeply decarbonize the global economy with a focus on, ele on electricity. We published this as a white paper at the Energy Innovation Reform Project, and I've since expanded this study with another colleague to over 30 different studies, and we're working on a peer-reviewed version of this paper. But what we find is there's actually strong agreement across the literature that a diversified mix of resources, including carbon capture and storage or nuclear or some of the technologies that are seeing more challenges today, offer the best chance at affordably decarbonizing the global economy. So where is this disconnect coming from? Why do we see so much progress in wind and solar, so many more voices arguing that we should be pushing ahead with these technologies, and yet experts who study this tech, these, these transitions saying, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. Hold on. Uh, wind and solar are, are a great source of progress, but probably not sufficient to get the job done. So in this talk, I want to unpack that dichotomy and try to un explain why wind and solar are, are going to provide a substantially larger share of our energy mix, but why they uh, reach challenges as we push towards a zero carbon mix or the deep decarbonization goals uh, that we have to meet by mid-century. So the mental model that's often employed here uh, to explain why we're at this fundamental tipping point at which solar and wind will run away with market share and we can reduce our public policy support for these technologies is that the cost of solar measured, or wind, in this case I show solar, measured as the levelized cost of energy or the average uh, price that solar must earn to recover its total costs over its life cycle, have fallen below that for new coal plants and more recently for new natural gas plants as well as we scale up solar uh, capacity worldwide, which is shown in the other axis. What drives this are experience curves, which basically describe this correlation between global installed capacity and cost reductions. Behind those experience curves will lie a number of different factors, including the fact that we've uh, 
manufacturers of solar systems or solar panels have reached much larger economies of scale in manufacturing. There's incremental learning in, by and doing, uh, learning by doing in both manufacturing and, and installation. And there's further technological progress in improving the cell efficiency, reducing material intensity, et cetera. So all of these factors are driven uh, forward as we deploy more of these technologies. Um, and this helps make clean energy cheaper. And indeed, the mental model was that we would use public policy to drive these technologies into the market and scale them up and drive their prices down. And once they cr cross over with the cr uh, price of conventional fossil fuels, we could reduce this public policy support, maybe direct it towards other technologies that might need it more, and see the market take over in this transition. And I have to admit, this was my mental model for four years when I worked as an uh, energy innovation policy advocate at the Breakthrough Institute, where our whole effort was designed to make clean energy cheap, and we were promoting innovation policies that could do just that. And the assumption was once we get wind or solar cheaper than coal, uh, the transition would be unstoppable. Unfortunately, this is a bit of a flawed mental model as I've learned in my PhD studies. It's a bit like comparing the price of a banana to the price of a burger and saying, well, a banana is cheaper than a burger, therefore we should only eat bananas. Not really the right way to think about it. Uh, they're not direct substitutes for one another. I should hope that you don't only eat burgers or only eat bananas. That'd probably be a pretty uh, incomplete diet. Um, and what we really want to think about is the cost of the banana versus the value that I derive from it in my overall diet, and the cost of the burger versus the value I get from it, right? So each one has its own direct comparison between cost and value, and they're not really comparable to one another. And the same is true for renewable energy resources that produce power at different times and produce energy with very different value in the power system than more reliable resources like coal, gas, or in the future, nuclear, uh, geothermal, and other more dispatchable or reliable resources. And indeed, as we drive the market share of solar and wind forward, not only do we drive their price down or their cost, but we also drive down the value of the marginal increment of additional deployment or the next gigawatt of wind or solar we deploy in the power system. So this graphic from a paper from uh, Varun Sivaram and Shail Khan in Nature Energy summarizes a number of different studies, including the Texas example from the uh, MIT Future of Solar study, which have articulated this declining marginal value effect for, for solar and indeed for wind as well as they push into the power system. So as we deploy more and more wind and solar, the value of these technologies drops along with their cost. And so rather than thinking about a race between the cost of wind or solar and the cost of uh, coal or gas or nuclear, we have to be thinking about a race between declining costs for these technologies and their own declining value in the power system. And which one wins depends on how much we can sustain support for these technologies to keep driving their prices down, both with deployment support and with uh, R&D efforts. So to explain why this value declines and unpack the, the reasons for it, um, we can use detailed power system models like the GenX model, which I developed with my colleague Nestor Sepulveda at MIT, which is an optimization-based model which does, tries to plan out the mix of resources that we might want to use to meet future demand in, say, 2030 or 2050. Um, subject to the kinds of engineering constraints that apply in the power system on how quickly you can turn up or down the output from power plants, turning on and off thermal units, um, meeting reserve requirements that you need to have to have this sort of short-run flexibility to handle uh, errors in your forecast for how much demand or wind or solar you have. So we can capture all these constraints in these models. We model an hourly resolution for a full year of data. Um, and we can model, if we want to, in certain studies, transmission and distribution networks as well, uh, and the impact of distributed resources. So these kinds of tools, which capture both the engineering and economic interactions between resources in a particular power system context, can help us understand the role that individual resources play within that overall system. And I'm going to talk today about three of four overall factors or mechanisms which drive the declining value of wind or solar as they penetrate further into the market. The first is the decline in what I call their fuel saving value or their ability to substitute for the generation, the energy of other uh, technologies with a higher variable or fuel cost. The second is a decreasing capacity value or their ability to substitute for the firm reliable capacity or megawatts installed from other, uh, other power plants that we have in the mix. And the third is an increase in curtailment or wasted extra generation from wind and solar that uh, exceeds the ability for us to absorb or use that generation when it's available. 
And then the final factor, which we, we can capture in our studies, but I'll, I'll leave aside for now, is that we also require increased operating reserve requirements to handle the variability in wind and solar at very short time scales. So that if you think you're going to have a certain amount of output from solar in the next hour, but a cloud passes across the region or the wind dies down, you need to have enough on, online power generation that can ramp up and make up for that shortfall on short time scales. It could be energy storage, it could be reliable um, power plants, uh, but it can't come really from wind or solar. And we also need to dramatically expand transmission networks to allow the integration of renewable resources from where they have the best quality uh, to where we need them, and to share renewable energy and demand across wider regions so we can smooth out the variation. And I'll talk a little bit at the end of this about how much more transmission we might need. But all those, all, both of those factors also scale up as you deploy more wind and solar. So let's focus on the first three here. And to illustrate this, I have um, graphics here which show the hourly generation across the peak day, so the highest day of demand in a Texas-like power system context. So demand profiles similar to Texas where you have high air conditioning loads in the summer, and wind and solar profiles for Texas as well, which is actually uh, a, has a great solar resource and a very good wind resource as well, and is one of the leaders in the country in renewable energy adoption right now. So what we see here is, you know, the demand increases and decreases over the course of the day as people go to work, as it gets hotter, as we turn on our air conditioners. The peak demand is shown with the black line there. That's the highest point of demand, and it's about, in this system, about 98 gigawatts or 98,000 uh, megawatts of demand. Um, and then we have the different resources in our mix under a 400 ton per gigawatt hour emissions limit, which is about 20% below where we are today. So this is about where we need to be in about 2020 to meet our goals under the Paris Climate Commitment or the former Clean Power Plan, for example. The mix overall over the course of the year is 64% of the energy from natural gas, 29% from solar, and 7% from wind. And we can see here natural gas forms this sort of undulating base of a power output throughout the day but it's flexible enough to move out of the way when we have a lot of solar power. And then in yellow, you've got solar, which obviously surges during the day and then drops off at night. And then a, a small band of, of, of wind power, which uh, spreads throughout the day. We have a little bit of gas combustion turbines in black, which are you know, used only during these peak demand days and most of the time sit idle because they're quite expensive. We have some energy storage in blue and then um, demand side flexibility in this case. So let's assume that the demand side of the equation becomes a bigger part of the system. So in red, we have price responsive demand curtailment. These are people who are simply saying the price of energy is higher than the value I get from consumption, and so I'm going to ratchet down my consumption when prices go high. And then, uh, in, blue, in the lighter pink, we have shiftable demand. This might be heating and cooling demand or, air, um, or electric vehicle charging, where you need a certain amount of energy, but you don't really care exactly when you consume it, and you can move it around uh, throughout the day. So you can see it shifting from that peak demand period into the evening hours. So that might be charging your electric vehicle overnight instead of charging it as soon as you, you know, get home from work in the evening. So this is the mix. It's a lot of different resources, playing, uh, each, of the, each playing their key role in the system. Um, and what we'll see here is in this, this keep an eye on, on a couple things. One is that we shift the peak in net demand, which is the time period we need to have reliable capacity um, other than solar or wind to meet the load or the demand minus the generation available from wind and solar. And because there's so much wind or solar right in the middle of the day, that net peak demand period actually shifts a couple hours into the evening. So the peak in demand happens at 5 p.m., but the time when we need the most reliable firm capacity to power up and meet the net peak shifts over to 7 p.m. when the sun starts to set, okay? And that'll move around as we go through these slides. Um, and that's important because it means the capacity substitution value from solar will change and wind. Because whereas you might get a lot of uh, solar production at 5 p.m., by 7 p.m. you have very little. So you might need 20 times, 20 megawatts of solar capacity at that time to displace one megawatt of reliable capacity. And the same is true for wind as it changes throughout the day. The second thing to keep in mind here is the annual marginal curtailment. So this is the, if you added one more megawatt of solar or wind to the power system, how much of that megawatt's output would be wasted over the course of the year because it exceeds the generation, exceeds the demand in that time period. In this system, there's basically no curtailment of wind, or, of wind power. It, it helps meet demand all year long. But for the next unit of solar, we're actually going to waste 16% of the output from that, that solar farm because it simply comes during, say, a May afternoon when we don't need that much energy, so people don't have their air conditioners on, and we've got a lot of solar power, and then we simply have to curtail it. And that's even with energy storage in this case, in this study being 75% cheaper than it is today, so very cheap energy storage. It just doesn't make enough sense to build the energy storage to absorb that output. Uh, it's better to just overbuild your production and, and waste some of it. All right? 
So what happens when we move to an 80% reduction in CO2, which is where we need to be economy-wide by about 2050? That's 100 tons per gigawatt hour. Well, the mix changes pretty dramatically. Now we have to substantially reduce our reliance on natural gas to help drive down emissions. So the share has gone down to 29% from natural gas in this case. Solar has surged to 28% and wind all the way up to 44% uh, in this case. And a couple interesting things have happened. The net peak demand has moved away from this hot summer day to a winter February night when everybody's running their you know, electric heating and light loads. And in that night, of course, you have no solar output. So solar no longer has any capacity substitution value. So you can deploy as much additional megawatts of solar as you want, and it won't help you shut down any of the reliable capacity that you need. The wind power output on this February night happens to be relatively low. That's why the net peak happens in that period. So it still takes 25 megawatts of uh, wind, in this case, to replace one megawatt of a more reliable source of power. So the capacity substitution value has already fallen dramatically. And now you see the marginal curtailment has soared. So 41% of the output from solar farms on the margin is wasted, and 61% from solar. And what that means is that in 61% of the hours of the year for solar, or the times that it generates, the marginal value in the marketplace for that energy is zero. It's worth less, okay? Not just worth less, but worthless. So, you know, the way we set market prices in wholesale markets is based on the marginal cost of the generator that could ramp up or down to meet the next unit of demand. And in a time period when you're curtailing solar or wind output, it's that free energy from solar or wind that could be used to meet an increase in demand. And so the market price in all of these hours will be set to zero, and 61% of the solar output will be worthless, and 41% of the wind output. And that's not just for the next marginal unit you deploy, that's for all the wind and solar on your system, because they're all also generating at that same time. Right? Wind output is obviously highly correlated, solar output highly correlated. So, um, so these are hours when all, all resources on the mix are receiving zero uh, for their market price. So this sig substantially reduces the value of solar or wind in our system. And unless the cost of solar or wind fall in, in step with their declining value, it no longer makes sense to deploy them any further. When we move to 50 tons per gigawatt hour, which is a 90% reduction in CO2, we're now starting to get into the deep decarbonization range, which I define as greater than 90% reductions in carbon emissions. Now something interesting happens. We start to see a share from nuclear energy in orange appear in the mix. Now nuclear is the only dispatchable zero carbon resource we put into this portfolio. We can have other things like carbon capture or um, hydropower with large reservoirs or geothermal. We put nuclear in this case because it's the one that's sort of geographically scalable across the whole US. You don't need a particular geology to do carbon capture or have reservoirs for hydro, for example. But consider this just a dispatchable zero carbon resource. Don't, don't focus on nuclear. But the interesting thing in this case is despite the fact that we include very cheap wind and solar and storage, and we price the nuclear in this scenario at the cost of the Vogel nuclear power plant just prior to bankruptcy. So still very expensive, but, but uh, before the delay introduced by the Westinghouse bankruptcy, we still get 17% of the energy in this context from this very expensive nuclear power. Why is that? When you have a wind or solar farm that you know, may, may cost far less, well, it's because the value of the wind and solar has degraded so much that it doesn't make sense to deploy anymore, and yet we have to do something to displace the natural gas and reach our further emissions reduction goals. So a reliable resource that can, dis that can substitute for natural gas one for one is suddenly much more valuable in this deeply decarbonized context. And we start to see nuclear share increase. Um, when we move to one ton per gigawatt hour, 99.9% .9 decarbonized, virtually carbon free, something more interesting happens, which is that the share from wind and solar starts to fall and nuclear dominates the mix, essentially displacing entirely natural gas um, in its role in the system. We have a little bit of gas we can use very occasionally on the peak demand days um, in a one ton case, and obviously can't use any in a zero ton case. So we've got a lot more energy storage helping. We still have a lot of wind and solar in this case. It supplies almost 40, uh, over 40% of our mix, but we need other resources as well to get to this zero carbon context. Uh, interestingly, we now have moved the curtailment rates back down uh, for these technologies, so wind and solar are a little more valuable here, and we've moved the, the peak demand period back to the, this, uh, this summer day. So that was just one scenario, and obviously there's huge uncertainty about what 
technologies might cost in 2030 or 2040 or 2050. How cheap will wind or solar be? What will natural gas prices look like? Will we have a new generation of nuclear plants that we can actually build on time or on budget? Who knows, right? And so that particular case was one of 300 different scenarios that we ran. Uh, my, my colleague Nestor Sepulveda, Richard Lester, Charles Forsberg, and Fernando de Cisternes and I in a paper on the role of flexible base resources in deep decarbonization of power systems. This is uh, working its way through peer review. We're revising by adding a few more sensitivity cases and resubmitting to the journal Juul. Um, and, uh, and, and so in this case, rather than look at any single snapshot, we look at a wide range of uncertain parameters and try to discern what robust uh, truths can we get out of that uh, uncertain space. So you know, focusing less on the specific numbers and more on trying to identify the role that particular resources play in the overall low carbon mix. What we find, there's actually about three different uh, distinct classes of resources in the low carbon portfolio. Now, the first are what we call fuel-saving resources, which is how we classify the variable renewable resources like wind, solar, and run-of-river hydropower plants, which vary when the stream flows change. As I, as I showed in the previous example, these have an initial capacity substitution value when you deploy a little bit of wind or solar. But once you deploy a lot of them, the periods when you need firm capacity essentially move to the times when you don't have any wind or solar output. And so at scale, in a, in a low carbon mix, these resources deliver almost all of their value to the system by displacing the fuel consumption of more expensive uh, resources like natural gas or, or coal. Um, and so there, we classify these as fuel saving variable renewables or vari variable resources. Then there's a set of resources that we call fast burst resources. These are technologies that are suited economically or technically to provide quick bursts of power when we need them and when they're most valuable. But they can't sustain that output because either in the case of energy storage, they have a limited reservoir of storage before they discharge. Or in the case of demand response or biogas run combustion turbines, they have relatively high variable costs. And so we don't want to really run them all that often, only when it's most valuable. So these resources provide a lot of capacity substitution value and very little energy substitution in the mix, as opposed to the fuel savers, which provide lots of energy substitution and, and no or very little capacity substitution. And then the final uh, class, which is the focus of our study, is the role of flexible base resources. Now, we've all probably heard of baseload resources in, in the power system context. This is a kind of an anachronistic term in a low carbon context with variable renewables. Baseload refers to the minimum level of demand or load on the power system over the course of the year. So if you think about the variation in you know, demand over a day, over the, the seasons. There might be a, you know, a warm spring day on a, on a Sunday when and, you know, people just have their windows open and they don't have to have their lights on and nobody's at work. And there's some lowest level of demand throughout the year. That base of demand is invariant then across the whole year. And it makes economic sense to run certain power plants with a high fixed cost and a low variable cost 24-7 uh, to meet that uh, base demand. So we traditionally run nuclear, coal, hydro plants as base load resources. Um, in a low carbon context with wind and solar, the base load is no longer what drives the minimum need for those resources. It's the net load or the load minus the output from the variable renewables. And that's going to be much more variable than the base load and much lower. And so what we need are not base load resources, but flexible base resources. These technologies are still economically suited to operate at a high capacity factor or annual utilization rate. Um, because they re have relatively high fixed costs versus their variable costs. Um, but they need to be flexible enough to pair with wind or solar output and change their output over the, the course of the day or the seasons. And this could be nuclear power plants that are operated more flexibly than we traditionally do today. Um, that's technically feasible and, and in a low carbon context makes economic sense. If we can develop affordable enough carbon capture and storage technologies that could allow us to continue to use coal or natural gas in this role, might be geothermal or biomass uh, or potentially seasonal storage. And I'll talk more about what that means at the end. But the, you'll notice that we have, we're making a lot of progress on the first two categories and very little on the third. And this is why we try to highlight the importance of these technologies in the low carbon mix, because we need something to fill this role. Right now, this is filled by natural gas combined cycle power plants. And you saw that in the previous examples, that under modest emissions reduction goals, gas plants are a great flexible base resource to pair with wind or solar. In a zero carbon context, we can't rely on natural gas, or at least we can't rely on natural gas without carbon capture. And so we need something that's going to substitute for those, uh, those gas combined cycle plants in a zero carbon context. And our list of candidates is nowhere near as mature or available as the uh, list of options for the, the other two classes of resource. <laughs> 
is what it looks like for the full week. This is that same, uh, the, the peak day is the second day in this week here that I showed you earlier. But this shows the full week, just for an example, to get a sense of what's going on. And here you see the flexible base nature of this, right? So here's your base load in this week. It's actually the minimum demand. But the minimum output that you want from your flexible base resource is actually quite a bit lower because you have this big surge of wind or solar on the first day. And so it's operating most of the time, uh, but it, it can ramp itself up and down over the course of the day to match solar and wind output. Let's recode these in the same colors as I had on the last graphic. So we've got our flexible base resource, could be nuclear, could be something else. Um, we've got our fuel saving resources in green, wind and solar, and then our various classes of fast burst resources, demand flexibility, energy storage, and demand response, in this case in red. So this is what a balanced portfolio looks like. And you'll notice this is different from the way we do things today. It's got a lot more wind and solar and demand flexibility, but it's not wholly different. It looks pretty similar to the way we operate the grid uh, today. This is what it looks like if we try to get there without a flexible base resource by relying on wind and solar as fuel savers and a bunch of fast burst resources to pair with them. Note, first of all, that the, uh, the y-axis is two times higher than the previous one. So we've doubled the capacity that we need in this case. Um, uh, and we are basically over-generating on a regular basis, even on the highest demand days that we see in this week, a huge amount of solar and wind output that exceeds our consumption. And we have to dump all that into energy storage here in red or simply curtail it in the hashed marks. We just waste all that output, even with cheap storage. And then we have to hold on to that energy and use it overnight when the, sol um, when the sun goes away, or even shift it seasonally from periods when we have lots of solar and wind to periods when we have very little throughout the year. This is a very different power system than the one we have today. It involves a massive overbuilding of capacity to, uh, make, itself through the, to make it through the variability throughout the year. Um, and it involves a huge role for energy storage and each of the resources in this context are used at a very low utilization rate. We have a lot of energy storage that's used only on these peak days to charge, and then hold on to that power for a long time and discharge it later. We've got a lot of wind or solar power with much of its output curtailed or wasted. Um, and, and this increases the average cost. So if the cost of a nuclear plant is 10 times the cost per megawatt of a wind farm, for example, which is about right today, um, but you waste 90% of the output from the wind farm, now the average cost per output from those two resources is comparable. And this is why we see both of them playing a role in the mix, because when we do this, we push things so far that the marginal value of wind or solar are very low, um, and in, in fact can approach zero in an extreme case. So I like to say this is a little bit like fielding a basketball team with solely point guards or solely power forwards. I mean, you can play the game, but you're probably going to lose to a team that has all the right players on all the right uh, roles on the team, right? Um, and so, you know, wind and solar are valuable parts of the team. Energy storage is a key part of the team. Um, but trying to field the whole team with just those resources makes it for a much harder game. And when it comes to decarbonization, it's hard enough already that we really don't want to be making it any harder on ourselves to reach our goals. Now, I mentioned the curtailment issue. I was talking about marginal curtailment, um, which is the, you know, how much of the uh, next unit of production would you waste, which tells you about the marginal value of the resource. But let's just talk about total curtailment, so the, uh, the total amount of wasted energy in a low-carbon, uh, renewable-centric uh, future. This is uh, my graphic, but from a, a paper from Bethany Frew, Mark Jacobson, and others at Stanford that looked at how we would get a 100% renewable electricity system or up to 100% renewable in the United States. And this is the average curtailment as we move from zero to 100% renewables here. And I've taken the you know, tons of gigawatt hours, which no one can really interpret, and reinterpreted this as a percentage of annual electricity demand in 2015. So what this shows is that in a 100% renewable future, we are simply wasting enough output to supply over 40%, about 45% of annual energy consumption, electricity consumption in the United States. So this gives you a sense of the scale of, how much, the scale of how much you have to overbuild your capacity and then put it to very little use. And this is even with very cheap energy storage and a huge fleet of electric vehicles that are assumed to be able to move their charging around in sync with the output from wind or solar. Now the other strategy besides storage and demand flexibility to help integrate wind or solar is expanding the area of our transmission grids and the area in which we trade or balance power across the country. Because whereas it might be windy in one place and less windy in another, demand might peak at one period of time in another place and then another, you can trade power across those regions and reduce the total need for uh, capacity. This is what happens in Fru's study if we uh, connect all 10 FERC regions uh, in the country with a transcontinental supergrid that can move power from anywhere in the country to another. 
And as you can see, you can get to about 60% uh, renewables without really any curtailment at this point. It, it helps a lot. But as you go towards 100, you still have this exponential increase in curtailment. And we're still wasting about 38% of all output from wind or solar, or sorry, enough output from wind or solar to supply 38% of annual electricity consumption with a transcontinental grid. And that's because you know seasons still happen all across the country. And it's night across the whole country. And so there are sort of a limit to how much you can smooth out the variability of these resources. We have high pressure fronts that will sit across the entire east, you know, eastern half of the country and lead to no wind power for weeks at a time, for example. So there's a limit to how much we can just move power around the country. If you had a link to the southern hemisphere, it, it might work. But so. Uh, we surveyed a bunch of renewable energy-centric uh, studies, and they all rely heavily on transmission expansion. So the National Renewable Energy Laboratory has this paper, uh, this study on renewable electricity futures. Um, and they propose to get to 90% renewables, we would need to double the high-voltage transmission grid in the country. Uh, McDonald and Clack at all great paper in Nature Climate Change also look at how you would co-optimize the transmission and the siting of renewables all across the country to reduce the total cost of the system. And they find that we would also need a high voltage DC or direct current supergrid, which would link all regions of the country and allow us to move wind from you know, the Great Plains to the East Coast or solar from the Southwest into the, East, uh, the West Coast cities um, and to trade power across the whole country. Um, and then again, Fru et al., as I mentioned, has this supergrid as well, which generally is exporting power from the Western United States into the East. So the importance here of flexible base resources is that it helps us avoid these sort of exacerbated challenges which rise nonlinearly as we try to push renewables towards the extreme. So we can keep the marginal value from those renewables from falling too much. We can sustain some of their capacity substitution ability. We can avoid the need for, you know, for an enormous increase in transmission. And we can reduce curtailment rates. And all that means that across a wide range of studies here, looking at, in this case, uh, energy storage that gets 50% cheaper or 75% cheaper than it is today uh, in these studies, and looking at both New England and Texas with very different renewable resource qualities and demand profiles, we see that in blue, the flexible base energy resource in a near zero emissions case dominates the overall portfolio. It uh, is anywhere from 55 to 80% of the overall mix, which is on par with the dispatchable resources in the mix today right now, um, uh, like coal or gas, which is directly substituting for it. And it reduces the overall cost of meeting our low carbon emissions goals um, by anywhere from about 20 to 50% which means it's half the price in the extreme case for New England to get to our low carbon goals than it is if we exclude any of these resources. And again, this is assuming very cheap wind and solar, increasingly cheap energy storage, and very expensive nuclear. If we assume that we can develop lower cost, flexible base resources in the future, that cost gap gets even more, uh, more dramatic. So I focused in nuclear in these examples, but I don't want to be misinterpreted. This is not a paper about nuclear energy. This is a paper about tech, uh, a class of technologies that can play the role of a combined cycle gas plant-like role in the power system without emissions. And that could be nuclear power. It's the one we have sort of available at largest scale today. It could be engineered geothermal energy, which would basically harness our expertise with hydraulic fracturing for natural gas to create artificial reservoirs um, of, of geothermal heat deep in the ground, where we can pump water in and get steam back out and generate electricity. And that would decouple the ability to produce geothermal energy from the necessary kind of particular hydrological and, and geological features that you need to produce geothermal today, and which restrict it basically to you know, the, the ring of fire type areas uh, of the world. It could also be carbon capture and storage. This is a picture of the Petronova plant in, in Texas, um, where we capture the emissions from uh, fossil fuels or biomass and store it in geological repositories. Um, if, if we want to get to a zero carbon context, crucially, that capture rate has to be 100% or very close to it, which is distinct from most technologies today, which capture between 60 and 90% of the CO2 emissions. Um, all post-combustion capture or gasification related techniques, uh, it have, it's very difficult to capture 100%. So in order to do that, you have to use technologies that, are, that use oxygen combustion or oxyfuel where they separate oxygen out of the atmosphere at the beginning and burn the natural gas or coal in a solely oxygen environment. And there you don't get any CO2. Um, uh, you only get pure CO2, and you don't have to worry about extracting it 
uh, from the post-combustion mix. There's a company I mentioned earlier called Net, Net Power, which is working with uh, Exelon and Mitsubishi to demonstrate a potential way to do this with a very different natural gas de uh, plant design uh, and is building their demonstration in Texas right now outside of Houston. Um, and so there could be a new you know, option there if that technology pans out. And it could potentially be, if you're lucky enough, very large reservoir hydro systems like you have in Canada, uh, parts of Canada or, um, or Scandinavia, for example, which have you know, basically a year's worth of energy stored up in the dams, reservoirs, and that could be used as a flexible base resource also. But we need something, something to play this role uh, to uh, reach a low carbon mix most affordably and reliably. I mentioned reservoir storage for hydro. That's really the only seasonal energy storage option we have right now. Batteries are really good for short-term you know, storage for a day or less. Um, we have some pumped hydro storage facilities, which are usually good for daily cycles. They can store power for like 8 or 12 hours. But other than very large reservoir hydro systems, there's really no option for seasonal storage, which is what you would need in a 100% renewable context. So this graphic from our lit review shows the week's worth of energy storage you would need in a couple of different 100% renewable cases to meet our demand reliably. And it would require anywhere between 8 and 16 weeks or 2 to 4 months worth of annual energy consumption that could be stored in the uh, reservoirs of this storage system. And just to give you a sense of scale about how different this is from what we're facing today, the 10 largest pumped hydro storage facilities in the United States, which hydro, pumped hydro represents like 99% of our energy storage capacity, could store just 43 minutes of US average electricity consumption. So 43 minutes versus four to eight months. And to give you a sense of the scale, this is a picture of the Grand Coulee Dam's uh, pump generating station in Washington, which is one of the largest pumped hydro storage facilities in the country. Here it is uh, from Google Maps. It uh, pumps water out of the Columbia River from behind the dam into the Grand Coulee River Basin uh, into a 27-mile-long uh, uh, reservoir. And that's enough to support, uh, store 25 gigawatt hours, or about 3 minutes and 30 seconds of annual US energy consumption. Here's what it looks like from space. You can still see it there uh, from the space station if you're up there. Um, so these are huge reservoir systems if that's what we're going to rely on to do it. And this is really the only proven technology we have for long duration storage. There's some new technologies on the drawing board. Uh, colleagues at MIT and the chemistry department, Yet Ming Chang, who started a couple of battery companies, and his, his colleagues have just spun out a new company called Baseload Renewables, which is trying to commercialize an advanced flow battery that uses sulfur, which is incredibly cheap. As a, as a material, and might be able to deliver seasonal storage at a cost that would be competitive. And flow batteries are much more energy dense than storing uh, kinetic energy in water, and so it would require many less dams, but still between 9 and 52 uh, reservoirs the size of that dam to store the electrolytes. Now, we wouldn't put it in a, in a lake, we'd put it in uh, some kind of container, but this gives you another sense of the physical scale of the energy storage resource you would need for this kind of solution. So the final uh, point I'll make about our study is that it really emphasizes that it's not a straight line path to zero carbon. The kinds of things you might want to do to meet our interim emissions reduction goals, which you can see the emissions tightening across the bottom axis here, and the shares of each of our resources in the mix, uh, unconstrained gas, coal, or sorry, nuclear in orange, and, and variable renewables, wind and solar in green, change dramatically, non-linearly, and non-monotonically as you move towards zero. So the share of wind and solar initially rises and reaches its peak in a power system that is about 80% decarbonized. And then as we move towards zero, it falls further. Well, why is that? As I mentioned, wind and solar are mostly fuel-saving resources. And in a power system with natural gas, they have a lot of value because natural gas is relatively expensive and we can displace the consumption from natural gas plants when we have wind or solar available. And as we tighten the emissions limit for the CO2 limit, that creates a shadow price on CO2 pollution or emissions, right? You have a limited budget of CO2 emissions and so when every time you burn natural gas, you're using a little bit of that budget up and you have to factor that into your accounting. And so in our models, that's captured. And what it means is that as we tighten the emissions limit, the fuel saving value of that wind or solar starts to climb. And that overcomes the declining marginal value effects that I talked about before to a point. Right? And so eventually you get some optimal limit of wind or solar in those contexts. Then as we move towards uh, our zero emissions case, we still have to do something to displace that natural gas. And in this case, we displace it with nuclear power, which has very low fuel costs. 
And so the fuel saving value from the wind and solar steadily falls as you displace fuel consuming and expensive natural gas with very cheap, you know, low fuel cost nuclear. So you have this interactive effect where the fuel saving value of the renewables falls and the ideal share in the optimal mix declines with it. These are the kinds of interaction effects that you have in a complex power system. Uh, they're not immediately intuitive where you can't take a single technology out of that mix and understand its value. You have to see how it interacts with the rest of the system in a particular context. And it may not be that the things we want to do to get to 30, 50, 60, even 80 percent reductions are the same kind of portfolio of resources that make the most sense in a zero carbon world. Um, and so that's an important lesson, I think, for policymakers and for research efforts, um, which have very long lead times and can lead to path dependencies as we move forward is that we have to look towards our end goal, which is zero carbon, and not solely towards the interim objectives. So to summarize some policy objectives or insights from this work or implications, the first is I think I've adequately stressed at this point, policymakers should not compare individual technologies based on their cost. So comparing a coal plant or a gas plant to a wind farm is like comparing that banana to the burger. It's not the same thing, and it's not a valid comparison. And furthermore, we have to consider their distinct role and value in a particular system context. And as I showed you in the last slide, that context changes, um, and so the value changes. So you can't abstract away from, um, you know, are we talking about the value of solar in Texas or in New England? Are we talking about it in a low carbon context or not? Are we talking about in a system where we have lots of nuclear or lots of carbon capture? All these things change the value of these technologies. The second is that policy today should not exclude uh, or eschew support for nuclear or carbon capture and storage simply because they have run into headwinds today, are more expensive than wind or solar, um, and therefore might, we might be tempted to abandon them. These resources are two of a very short list of candidates that might be able to play the flexible base role. And that's a distinct role in the power system for which there are few substitutes. So it would be unwise to simply say these technologies are difficult, let's abandon them. Rather, we should redouble our efforts to overcome the challenges associated with not just these two technologies, but also developing new options like engineered geothermal or seasonal storage options that might also play this role in the future. That connects to the next uh, implication, which is that technology policy efforts, which drive research and development investments and early market deployment for new technologies, need to make multiple bets or investments in each class of resource uh, so that we can assure that we have one or more viable options that can play each of those three roles in our, mi in our mix. And that includes flexible base resources. It's important to remember that wind and solar are as cheap th as they are today because of decades of sustained support from public policy. We invested in R&D and demonstration in early deployment in tax uh, credits and feed-in tariffs to scale up these technologies to the point where they are today. And if we don't make the technology policy investments now in a suite of flexible base resources, they simply won't be available in the 20 years from now when we need them. These technologies don't come uh, overnight. And fourth, as I mentioned, it's not a straight line path to zero carbon. And so we really need to be thinking about the overall pathway and not just interim objectives. And beware potential lock-in or path dependency from making policy in a myopic or short-sighted incremental way. And this tends to be how we do it. So we set renewable portfolio standards for 2025, and then we get to 2020 and we're on track to meet them. And we say, well, let's increase that standard and push it out to 2035. And we move forward incrementally like that. Or we set a 2020 CO2 reduction goal. And then in California's case, they're about to meet that. So now they've set a 2030 goal you know, without necessarily looking ahead at the final objective. And that may lead to suboptimal decision making and path dependencies that may, in the worst case, this isn't guaranteed, but in the worst case, make it even more difficult to get to our zero carbon goals um, than it would otherwise be. And then finally, given the substantial uncertainty that we face about the future technology costs and availability over this time period, policies where possible should remain flexible create and preserve maximum optionality in, and, and choice in our, in our future, and avoid locking in or committing to single pathways, which may turn into dead ends as we move forward. Um, and so this argues for things like technology neutral standards rather than uh, renewable portfolio standards that sort of only support a particular class of technology. Um, and make sure that we're supporting all three of the classes of resources that we need and allowing the best contenders for each of those classes to emerge over time. One last concluding thought, I've focused mostly on cost here today, and that's because I think it's central. It's one of the limiting factors in our ability to decarbonize. You know, there's plenty of money in the world that if we wanted to invest in these kinds of things, we could build a low-carbon economy. We have enough resources and wealth to do that. Unfortunately, 
Climate change is just one of many priorities that publics face and that you and I face when we decide to spend our money. And most public opinion and political economy research would indicate that there's a limited public willingness to pay to decarbonize the economy. And that means that the cost of decarbonization is the key to how fast we make progress. Um, we can try to increase our willingness to pay and climate campaigners and environmental groups and others are pushing advocacy to do that. And I think that as we see the impacts of climate change become more apparent every day around us, I think our willingness to pay will increase, but probably not anywhere near as fast as the cost of technology might decline. So I focused on cost, but that's just one of several axes that we care about and one of the, several of the, the societal costs or impacts of our energy system. There are things like land area impact that are you know, disruptions to land and ecosystems from our energy infrastructure, both production and transportation of energy. There are technical and reliability challenges, engineering constraints that might limit our ability to move forward with a particular path if we run into them. Um, there are up and downstream environmental impacts like nuclear waste disposal and mining. Um, there's uh, industry scale up constraints. I mean, the, the, the industries don't go from zero to 100 overnight, right? There, you have to scale up and build up the industrial capacity to deploy technologies at scale, and that might be a limiting factor. And you have air pollution, obviously, from our current energy system. We have enormous air pollution impacts. In the United States, more than 10,000 people still die prematurely every year from air pollution from uh, power plants, mostly coal. So there are a whole bunch of different axes that you might care about, and um, this is really kind of a societal multi-objective you know, optimization function, not just cost. Um, and so I would argue that even with this sort of multi-objective uh, framework, a balanced portfolio of different resources is likely to offer the best way to minimize damage along all of these axes and find the right balance. And that's because a lot of these different challenges rise non-linearly as you move forward. And so, um, you, you, you may not want to push anyone to the extreme, or it will mean that challenge, whether it's cost or air pollution or land use impacts, becomes very substantial. And so a balanced mix helps you choose a combination of resources which minimizes impacts along all of these axes, because every technology has different costs and trade-offs. So nuclear power, for example, might have bigger up and downstream impacts, uh, may contribute to a lower cost system depending, uh, is reliable, so reduces techn technology challenges. Um, and has very little land, land impact. It's the most energy dense way we have to produce energy. Whereas renewables have zero air pollution, you know, little up and downstream impacts from mining of materials, um, but have substantial land area impacts, right? Wind and solar farms stretch across wide areas. We need to double that transmission grid to move power around. So there's different axes and trade-offs here. And I would argue that if we picked uh, a renewables exclusive or nuclear exclusive or gas exclusive mix, we risk exacerbating any one of these challenges to the point where society might say, hey, let's stop this. This is too much cost to drive decarbonization. And so I'll just leave with that thought, which is that you know, cost is important, but not the only factor. And I think that as we think about multiple axes, and there are probably more that you know, we could throw out on this list, a balanced portfolio gives us the best ability to mix and match resources that minimize cost across all of those uh, different axes. All right. Thank you.